Big question we've had a lot lately is the first beat and where to go and what to look for. We've just done a regatta at Taraba Sailing Club here, a national at Taraba Sailing Club here with a variety of wind strengths and a variety of wind directions. And a lot of people struggle with which way to go and why to go there, including me, even though people don't think that was the case. It was a very difficult regatta. Um, this question that we've been asked to talk about the first beat, in some venues is really easy and some venues is really hard. And what to look for can get a bit complicated. So I'll try and keep it simple and if it's not simple enough, people can ask for Adrian and we'll, we'll some specific questions and we'll refilm this one. Because I'm even I find this one hard. So first beat, do your homework. Get out on the racetrack early, and I mean early, and go and sail from the bottom of the first beat to the top of the first beat, from the left hand side of the first beat to the right hand side of the first beat, and have a look at as much of the course as possible. Um, what am I looking for? Number one, I'm looking for pressure. And where is it? Where is the strongest wind on the course? So quite often before I start, you'll see us standing up. Even after we've done our homework, you'll see us standing up and looking at the breeze and, and just making sure that nothing's really changing. So if the top mark's down there, up there, and the start line's down here, I'm asking myself, where is the pressure? Is the pressure, I'm breaking everything in thirds. Is the pressure in the middle? Is the pressure on the left? Is the pressure on the right? Or is the pressure constantly changing? The next question I'm asking myself, and a lot of people don't seem to think about this one so much, is is the pressure at the top of the course? Is it at the bottom of the course? Or is it in the centre of the course? I need to know that information because that's going to tell me a rough plan of where I want to go. So for example, if the pressure's on the left, I'm obviously going to go left. If the pressure's on the right, I'm going to go right. That part's pretty easy. If the pressure's flowing down the middle of the course, I'm going to work in the middle of the course. But when I look at this, quite often you might see a top buoy that's tucked in close to a mountain, which means the top half of the course might be quite light in this region up here. So I want to spend the shortest amount of time in that top region up there, which means I might take attack and take a long tack across the course before I jump into there, take a short one and get back through. So I still need to know where's the pressure on the course because I want to spend most of my time where the pressure is because pressure is speed obviously, that one's pretty simple. So the first thing I'm doing my homework on is pressure. Where's the pressure on the course, what's the pressure doing? I think most people can understand that and most people can see pressure. They might not understand what it's doing but they can see pressure. So that's my first part of my homework, find out what's going on the course. The second one, I've got a compass in my boat. These days I have spent a bit more money and I've got one of those tactic things because they're so easy to read. I'm now going to go out in the course and I'm going to go and take some measurements on what the breeze is doing because that's going to tell me one of two things. So the first thing I'm doing is pressure, the second thing I'm doing is direction or compass numbers. So you'll see me sailing various sections of course on both tacks trying to work out what's going on. So with my compass, the first thing I'm trying to do is work out is the breeze oscillating. So is the breeze going from here to here to here to here? And if so, how big is it doing? If it's not oscillating, it's being what's called a persistent shift. Persistent. Hopefully my spelling's good this regatta. Um, persistent shift means the breeze might start here and out, half an hour later it might be there, half an hour later it might be there, half an hour later it might be there, half an hour later it might be there. Because that's going to determine what I'm going to do on the course. Now, if I've got, a pers if I've got an oscillating breeze, I'm going to tend to stay towards the middle of my racetrack. If I've got a persistent breeze, I am going this way first. So I'm going to sail towards the knot on a persistent shift. So if it's from the left, I'm going to go left hard to start with straight off the start line. If it's from the right, I'm going to go right hard to start with straight off the start line. So there's another clue on which way I might go off the course. Compass will tell me that. Sometimes on a racetrack, you get tricked if you don't have a compass on board. So it's really handy to have one on board. 
So persistent and oscillating is going to determine what I'm going to do. A really simple way to look at it is if the breeze is oscillating, sail a long tack first. The one pointing closest to the buoy, but if it's a persistent breeze, no, sail the short tack first. If you think about it, logic will tell you why, which, why to do it. I'll let you guys work that one out for yourself, but there's a couple of hints there. So, I'll start looking at direction. Now I'm going to complicate direction here for a second. Because where we've just raced at Taralba is a prime example of this, because it's got lots of shorelines. Remember I said I break the course up into thirds that way? And thirds that way. Top mark was up here, start line was down here. Part of my homework is finding out what is the breeze at the top of the course doing. And in a lot of cases, at this regatta, the breeze at the top of the course was actually coming from that direction. In the lower section of the course, it was a bit more in that direction. And in the midsection, it was actually oscillating. So it gave you a fairly good map on where to go. But you had to actually work out what the breeze in each section of the course was doing, which is why some people thought it was great to launch straight off the start line and head straight out this way, and then completely ignore the oscillations through the middle. Other people would come hard out this way, but then take a big knock into the buoy at the top of the course. You actually have to break the course up and actually look at what the breeze is doing in different regions of the course so you can work out which is the best way to approach. Now, in my diagram, obviously, in this section of the course, you're going to want to go out that way. In this section of the course, you want to go out that way. And in the midsection, you're going to zigzag up this line here. Okay? And that's just in that diagram that I've drawn there. But you actually need to look at it on the water. While I'm on that, I remember reading this one a long time ago in one of the sailing magazines and it stuck with me for forever. I don't know what it was said in the magazine, but I'm just going to put down as risk because I keep talking about risk with my sailing. If this is the top mark, there's our start line. If I come out on starboard tack, port tack, starboard tack lay line, port tack out of the boat, I've got what I call a race area, which I'm going to stay in. That's the port corner. Population, hopefully nobody. That's the starboard corner. Top mark. And think about your persistent shift and your oscillating breeze here for a second. If that's my race area, how much risk am I willing to take? If I believe this port corner is 100% going to be a persistent shift to that corner, what am I going to do? I'm going to sail pretty much to that corner because I know in my head it's 100% the, the way to go. Now how often in sailing are you 100% sure of where you should go? I'm not. I'm never 100% sure. I can tell you now that if I believe that that left hand corner is the way to go, I'm still only going to go to the, okay there's my 50% line. 75% line, 25% line. And if I take that line up into there, you can see we're going to start getting regions of risk. Here's our 50 on the other side, 25, 75. So if I'm only 25% sure that left is the way to go, yet the whole fleet's going left, Will I go with the fleet? Yes, even though I don't want to go there. Will I go with the fleet? Will I go out to a 50 or 70% line? No. I'll go until I feel comfortable, which is maybe the 25% line, and then I'll come back towards the middle because I don't believe it. But, say we're in New South Wales and we've got a big black nor'easter predicted, I pretty much know in my head that that breeze is going to rotate left all day. And that's what it's going to do. So I'm going to take my risk and I'm going to go a lot further out here and I might go to about the 80 5% line before attack. I'm still never going to go there. Because to me, a corner is it's pretty rare. I've ever seen a corner be worth it. 
So I hope you guys can understand that. Only go as far as you feel comfortable. If you believe that the breeze is oscillating, you're gonna definitely stay in the center region up here. And what you're gonna notice is the closer you get to that buoy, the more taps you're gonna do. You might notice that in your races at your club at home, but the closer you get to the buoy, the more taps you're gonna do. And it's just a factor of this, well, the risk is up here. And a way to show that that risk isn't worth it, the closer you get to the buoy is really, really easy. That made sense, didn't it, Adrian? That's good. I want you to all think about this for a second. Forget the corner, because that's an extreme example, but here's my top mark. Here's a long ley line out here. A long ley line. I don't like long ley lines, because I'm hopeless at them. Um, but if I've got a long ley line, if I sail out to this ley line, and I tack on it, and it's a really long one, I want you to think for a second. If the breeze lifts, is it a winner or a loser? So here I am, I've sailed it here, the breeze now lifts. I've now overlaid the buoy because if it lifts, I could have actually tacked wet. So I've sailed too much extra distance. So lift is actually a loser mm. if I go to the ley line too early. The opposite of that is obviously a knot. And if I'm at, if I'm at the ley line too early and it knocks, I'm now sailing a much longer course, at which point I've now got to tack back again. Everyone over here has been advantaged by a lift. So again, a knock is a loser. So if it lifts or knocks and you've got a long ley line that you're already on, you've lost and you're lost. Which is why you need to understand that the closer you get to the mark, the more you're trying to stay in the centre region to take advantage if it's lifting and knocking. If it's consistent, fair enough. Go to the ley line, go to it early. But if there's any movement in the breeze, it's not worth the risk being on the ley line early. And people need to realise that. It's also not, please be aware, I'm not saying come in at the last second and take the boy, because that's also risky, as we all know by the rules, but it's worth noting that don't hit the ley line too early. What are you going to gain from it? Chances are you're actually going to lose. And I don't think people realise that. Um, I hate overlaying marks. I hate sailing extra distance. It's not worth it. So there's a slight extra on this. So my third point there was manage your risk. Decide how much risk you're willing to take to how far width you're willing to go on the course. Um,